Again, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about how to measure women's economic empowerment and financial inclusion. We're very excited to have all of you here. And my name is Jenny Morgan. I'm a lead facilitator for the Impact Pathways area um, at Finequity. And this webinar is a joint effort of Finequity, Center for Global Development, and Data2x. And thank you, Luis, for introducing yourself. That's a great prompt. If people would like to just introduce themselves in the chat, um, feel free to paste your LinkedIn profile in there. We won't have time for introductions with everybody, but we would love to be connected and stay in touch. So please do that if you have a minute. Um, again, we're here for the webinar today on uh, measuring women's economic empowerment and financial inclusion. I'd like to walk us through the agenda so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> again, I'll be presenting today on the, uh, the initiative for we in women's financial inclusion. Um, it's a learning initiative that we've uh, been working on for the past year plus, where we developed a core set of indicators, which I'll walk through and also talk about our, uh, our uh, collab, which is the process we plan to do for testing the indicators, which comes next. Following my presentation, uh, we'll have a partner presentation from CARE. CARE was a part of our core advisory group for this initiative, and they're going to walk us through their own framework for measuring women's economic justice. Um, and then after that presentation, we have uh, a lot of time left for the panel discussion. In just a second, I'll introduce you to the panelists. And then following the panel, we'll have some time for audience Q&A. Uh, because we're such a large group, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, allow you all to unmute and, and speak your questions. So feel free to pop questions into the chat at any point. Uh, there's a large group of us here, so we'll be able to answer the questions in the chat and the ones we're able to speak to during the Q&A, we will call out and answer those. Just a few other housekeeping is um, we will be sharing this presentation and there will be a recording that will be posted on the event page afterwards. In addition, we'll have several links to both the brief, the background paper that we're going to be talking about, as well as several of the resources that were referenced um, during this process. So keep an eye out in the chat for some of those links. And with that, I'd just like to introduce the panel. So again, my name is Jenny Morgan. I'm from Finequity. And then we have Megan O'Donnell from the Center for Global Development, who's the co-director for Gender Equality, and she'll be uh, moderating the panel discussion and Q&A, and she's one of the co-authors of the brief. And then we have Solan Chai from CARE. She's the senior technical lead and program manager, and she'll be presenting on CARE's framework. For the panel, we have Justin Archer from Women's World Banking. Um, just one second. He's the lead for the global quantitative research there, and he was part of our core group of advisors. And we also have Megan Morris from JPAL. She's a policy manager, and she'll be um, speaking to her experience as well on the core group of advisors and sharing some resources or some tools that JPAL has developed um, in this area. So I think we can go to the next slide. Great. So here I want to talk about a little bit about the rationale for the learning initiative um, and then talk to you a little bit about what we did this past year. So this initiative really builds on um, the work, the previous work by Data2x, uh, WIFID Partners, that's uh, Women Financial Inclusion and Data Partnership, CGD, and FinEquity Community of Practice. So as you all have seen, and I'm sure from you know participating in this webinar, there's there's a lot of interest um, in this topic, and there's been a large number of we measurement guides, indexes, and indicators um, put out in recent years. And so you know, it's they're looking at promoting and measuring we in the context of financial inclusion. However, what we saw was that there is not a there was not a harmonized definition for how to understand we within WeFi, 
or a common set of indicators. And so that made it difficult to know which financial inclusion initiatives and investments were, are most beneficial for WE outcomes. So that was sort of the background of why we convened this group and decided to work on this project. And we, we kind of kicked this off in late 2022. Um, and we, we had a series of things that we did, but it, it kicked off with the webinar where we were discussing the topic and the rationale and sort of gauging interest from the community to work on this. And then what we did, Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, it kicked off in late 2021 because 2022 is when we did all of these other things here. So we started by doing a resource review, and that came primarily from the core group of advisors. And I'll get to that in just a second, of which organizations and who was a part of that, where we looked at their various tools and resources, frameworks, set of indicators that they had them. Um, and we reviewed about 21 different resources. So following that survey and resource review, looking at definitions, we convened the core group approximately five times last year, and they were working calls where we worked through both uh, definitions, um, theory of change, multiple iterations of the theory of change. We mapped uh, indicators, the existing indicators to our theory of change that we had developed. And then from there, we were able to come up with a core set of indicators, which I'll be presenting in a minute. All of this is documented in the background paper that was just published yesterday, so hot off the press. And my colleague Alba will be sharing uh, links to where you can find that paper. And as I mentioned, sorry, last point on that last slide, Annika, um, you know, the next step will be to test these indicators in a collab. So. On to the next slide. I won't read out all of the members, but I would like to thank all of the core group members for their hard work and all of their effort and time that they put in to making, um, to getting us to the point where we are today. So I'll just give a second here. You can see quite a list of organizations that were involved and several folks from different organizations in some cases. Okay, I think we could move to the next slide. And again, the core group of advisors are also listed in the background paper, so um, you can find them there. All right, and then here, as I mentioned, our sort of first uh, step here was trying to come up with a harmonized definition for we within women's financial inclusion. But before we did that, you know, we reviewed many, many different resources. Um, and then what we saw was that all of the definitions contain a definition of financial inclusion, as well as core elements of access to and use of resources, the exercise of agency and economic achievements. And while in the end, we did not agree on a collective, you know, one single collective definition, we did agree that whatever definition there is should include the, these common elements of resources, agency, and achievements in our theory of change and in our uh, suggested list of indicators. So I think we could go ahead, great. So here you have our theory of change that we developed. And again, there were a couple, you know, we went through lots of discussions and a few iterations, but this is where we ended up. Starting with the column on the left, you see interventions, financial inclusion. Um, there's a long list here, and these are this is by no means intended to be an exhaustive list. The point here is that these are illustrative examples of the range of investments in, and interventions that um, we know are out there. But our theory of change is intended to be quite broad in the sense that you know we we don't we want to be able to capture many different kinds of interventions and, and, and investments there. So just so that you understand what, what is there in the bullets. And then when we're moving on to the resource column here, the three elements we wanted to focus on were context change, household change, and attitude shifts, and then capabilities. And so those are the knowledge and skills, confidence, and independence. 
there's a lot wrapped up in this. Um, I think when we go to the slide on the indicators, I'll walk through some of what's included here, but there are things like gender norms and household dynamics and um, those types of elements. Uh, moving to the next column here on access, this is where we're talking about financial access and behavior change. Um, these are obviously core and fundamental pieces of, of, of this um, we in financial inclusion. What I want to say here is that, or point out is that, um, while this is obviously essential, we ultimately as a group decided not to include indicators around access and usage, um, simply because we felt that many organizations already have their own way of, of measuring this. And so therefore we would like you know, to, for folks to be able to use the, the measurements that they have. And for the organizations that don't have a way or don't, you know, or don't have a standardized way to do this, we have several resources in the background paper, and we'll be sharing those links as well of recommended um, sources for being able to uh, pull these indicators from. So I'm going to move us to the next one. And that is, you know, the same case here for usage, but we're looking at, you know, payments, bank account savings, capital loans, insurance. But again, we don't have indicators within our own uh, suggested set that will speak to this. And then we move to the column of agency. And so here we're looking at increased privacy, increased mobility, increased control over uh, resources and time. Um, and then we also look at things like self-esteem, self-efficacy, goal setting. And then we move to the final column here on achievements. And so we're looking at these changes in income, changes in profits, assets, financial health, um, very important things. And then looking at also the subjective changes in women's agency and economic empowerment, as well as potential spillovers in terms of positioning in the community and intergenerational changes. And those are really, you know, that's the main sort of bulk of what we wanted to look at in terms of final we outcomes. So I know there, there's a lot on this slide and I've kind of quickly walked us through it, but I've, again, these are, you can find this in the background paper. So I wanna go ahead and move us to the next slide here. As I mentioned before, you know, the next step of our process was to really take uh, all of the different frameworks that we had gathered and sample, uh, not sample, but you know, indicators that other organizations were already using and map them onto our own theory of change. So this theory of change is the same as the previous slide, but the colors here are indicative of the number of organizations that had an indicator within this element. So you'll see, for example, context change had the number 12 there. Um, these were pretty evenly actually within those, that first resource column. And then the second one is grayed out because I mentioned we weren't we are not going to include those in the suggested indicators, but then you'll see the brighter the red box, the more indicators, the more organizations who had indicators within this element. So these bullets are the same as before, but this is just to show you the rationale and the logic behind why we included certain indicators in our suggested list. So I am going to, I think, move us to the next slide here. And for those of you who just joined us, thank you. And thank you all for introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, and here we have the proposed set of indicators. I'm not gonna read all these out. <laughs> There's a lot of text here. Um, but I do just want to walk us through, you know, how it's structured. So we have on the left hand side, the elements to measure from the theory of change. And then we have, you know, the uh, column headings here on resources, outputs, access usage, agency, um, which are the intermediate outcomes, etc. So for example, within this top box here, I wanna just point out, we have you know, context change, household change, attitude shift. 
when we look at the indicators, the types of indicators we're suggesting here are, you know, change in the positive attitude about women and paid work. So looking at percentage of women, percentage of men. We also have an indicator here around change in the percentage of women who participate in economically productive activities. And then a third indicator here on change in the percentage of women and men who report confidence in using financial products or services. There are, of course, many, many, many other indicators, but these are the ones the group collectively uh, you know, highlighted and wanted to emphasize, and so therefore that's what we're proposing in our list. Um, I won't walk through each of these indicators, but I just want to point out again, in case you missed, the, the access and usage indicators are obviously essential, and we you know, would like to see these harmonized across organizations, but we're recommending that folks refer to the WIFID data dictionary as well as a couple of other um, resources that we mentioned in the background brief and that the data that's collected be sex disaggregated data. I'll pause here just for a minute if you'd like to read through these indicators in terms of you know uh, the agency indicators. I think we could move to the next slide, Annika. Okay, great. So again, I'm, I won't read through all of these, but the life satisfaction one is a continuation from the previous slide. And then we have five indicators around achievements. And some of these, you know, there's some varying degrees of how developed these indicators are. Uh, we will be further developing these in a measurement guide, which will be a part of the collab process. But some of the indicators, for example, around financial health, are come directly from Findex, for example. And so these are indicators that they have used and tested. And so they're quite detailed in terms of um, how they would be measured. But other indicators are, you know, less so in terms of um, looking at change, and so they're not as descriptive. Just going to pause here for one minute, and then we'll move to the next one. Um, I think we could go ahead, uh, Monica. Thanks. This is my last slide. Uh, as I mentioned, our, our next step is really to test the indicators. So, you know, there was a lot of thinking and collaboration that went into developing the proposed indicators. But then what? So um, Finequity has a process, has tested a process that they've called a collab in the past. And we've done that with the gender norms project. And so we're gonna follow a similar structure here, um, looking at you know, these three different phases is just describing the process of a collab. Um, and we will continue to work with CGD and Data 2X and a smaller group of institutions that are willing to test this with us. Um, I don't have all of the organizations, so I can't tell you the names right now, but we have folks like Village Enterprise who have already committed and several others that are just in discussions, we're in discussions with right now. So, We'll be, you know, designing and launching the collab. We're in the process right now of inviting participants to be a part of the collab and selecting the partners. Again, we'll have about three to five organizations that will be a part of this. Then we will kick off the collab and look at different um, refining the agenda, coming up with this measurement guide that we'll be co-creating, and this is a, you know, form of action research and peer learning. And then this final phase of documenting and disseminating. So. After you know this six to ten months that we'll be involved in the collab, we'll be documenting it along the way and things like blogs and um, you know other discussions that we'll have with the partners, so that we can share this out with the community as we go. And at the end, we'll have a brief that documents both this measurement guide that we co-create as well as um, what you know the partners learned in the process of testing these indicators within their own organizations. Uh, the timeline is essentially this year. So this was our launch of the background paper, and then we will be moving into the next phase of testing uh, at the end of this month, and that will continue through 2023. So with that, 
concludes my portion of the presentation. Um, I know it was pretty quick, but you know we're here and you can reach out to us and also read more about it in the background note. So can we please go to the next slide? Great. So now I want to uh, uh, hand it over to Solange High, who I introduced earlier, and she's going to talk us through CARES framework. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and uh, thanks to Finequity for the invitation to present uh, CARES approach and CARES experience with, um, with measurement. I'm really excited to be here and to hear um, about the launch of the, the paper. So I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to frame um, what I'm going to present as CARE's work because about three or four years ago, um, CARE decided to, to shift the name of um, what, what we used to call women's economic empowerment uh, to women's economic justice and doesn't fundamentally change the the way we do our work or what we do, we just felt that it it really reflected um, the rights based approach that we that we have at CARE. Um, and so when we're talking about women's economic justice, it's um, the fulfillment of women's fundamental human right to economic resources and the power to make decisions that affect their lives. Um, this requires women to have equitable access to and control over um, these economic resources, and that includes time, the time and opportunity to engage in activities. Um, but it also requires changes to discriminatory social norms and economic structures, laws, policies, and practices that marginalize women. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I can share with you the um, theory of change. One more click and then we get through to it. Sorry about that. Um, so the way that we, it was actually really exciting to hear Jenny's um, presentation and see all of that um, how that how that harmonized approach has come together, um, because it, it feels so much like it like cares approach matches on to this and would be really easy to to apply. Um, so we view this um, the the ability to be able to achieve women's economic uh, justice at three levels. So there's the agency level, the relations level, and the structures level. And at the agency level, um, it's about women having the choice, capability, confidence, skills um, to be able to pursue and realize um, their economic rights and their aspirations. Um, so really within the sphere of influence of, of the, the individual. Then we move on to the relational level, which um, deals with um, relations and power dynamics, decision making at uh, the household, the workplace and community level. And um, the structural change in the structural level is about formal and informal power holders working to build economic systems which are gender just and equitable. Um, and we see um, women's economic justice being achieved by working at these at these three levels, which um, it's it's um, is key to our approach and how we design programs and also how we measure them. I'll um, move on to the next. So within that, um, the way that we've we've set up the work that we do, um, and also the way that we measure it, is around these three levels. Uh, so there's a, a global indicator for agency, which is number and percent of women who have increased capability to participate equitably in economic activities. At the relations level, uh, women who have been who have actively participated in economic decision making in the household, and or in their workplace or community. Uh, at the structural level, um, it's about newer amended policies, legislation, public program, or budgets which impact um, women's equitable access to and control over economic resources. Now we see these as uh, framing indicators, like umbrella indicators, where we then have other ones underneath that we would be looking at. In a similar way, right, CARE is a large organization and we want to be able to harmonize our uh, our approach across um, different types of programming. Um, and this women's economic justice framework does cover quite a bit from uh, dignified work uh, to uh, producers, entrepreneurs, savings groups. Um, so this, this um, approach and this model allows us to be able to um, measure a group of uh, and a lot of indicators at, at each of these levels at the agency relations and structures levels. Um, but really what we're, we're trying to look at is, uh, you know, what skills have been developed, knowledge, access to financial resources, assets, 
uh, at the agency level is includes you know measuring uh, self-efficacy, uh, negotiation and communication skills, um, digital literacy. Um, we get into a uh, level of income. Um, so all of that can can be included in there and and um, and more so depending on uh, the the programming itself. At the relations level, we're um, looking at participating in economic decision making, um, participating in formal or informal groups, um, uh, measuring uh, unpaid care that's happening at the, in the household, um, joint decision making, and at the structures level, uh, we are looking on one side on um, public policy changes, so changes to um, to policies that improve um, access or improve certain um, ways that women can, can access financial resources. But within this structural level, we're also looking at changes in financial institutions. Are there better and improved uh, financial products and services that reach our target segment of micro and small um, entrepreneurs, uh, primarily women? And so when we look at the structural level uh, on that formal side, it can also be private sector led. And here we're also looking at um, social norms change. I'll move to the next slide, if that's okay. And I'm gonna give an example from specific to our women's entrepreneurship uh, programming. What, what are we measuring? Um, and this is across a few different uh, programs, but you can, I won't go it in, into it in detail, you'll be able to look at it later. Uh, but at the agency level, we're looking you know, at things like daily business earnings, um, whether or not the training improved, improved their business, um, access to loans and confidence in running their business. In relations, as I mentioned before, time spent on unpaid care work, the amount of time they spend on their business, whether and and the whole uh, part around men and boys engagement in in the business in the in unpaid care work and how whether that's changing any relations within the household and along that line there's joint decision making independent decision making and at the structural level looking at access to market information um, capital mobilized for loans and I'll go into that later how much has been mobilized through the programming um, and improved uh, policies. Um, on to the next one. And I'd like to close just with three things of moving forward. Um, I, I think one thing that we're really eager about looking, really spending more time on and looking into is social and gender norms, both ensuring that in financial inclusion programming, there are interventions and that we're, we're measuring it. Um, and that leads me to the next one, innovative measurement methods. Um, you know, sometimes these measuring social norms can be really cumbersome and, um, and take a really long time or be expensive. Um, so looking at lean um, ways of data collection and analysis, as well as more frequent data collection for certain indicators where that really helps us, right? When we're looking at um, number of loans that have been dispersed, um, that's that's something that we would like to see more frequently, whereas there's there's other changes that are slower. And the, the last point I'd like to talk about is this structural level, right? So that structures level that I was mentioning before, um, capturing in, enough of that and capturing something that's that's holistic and, and gives a real image. And I want to give the example here of uh, our Ignite uh, program, which is funded by the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, was an investment of 5.5 million um, US dollars in the program itself. So for all of the interventions of the program, and we've worked with uh, multiple financial service providers in three countries and been able to mobilize 145 million US dollars in loans for our target group. Um, and that's that's something where we think maybe there's a way of, of not just saying it's this many products that have been um, adapted or this many uh, people, but really what is happening in the market and what's been uh, what's been opened up. Um, and that's that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Solange. We are looking forward to bringing you back into conversation with our other speakers in a moment. Um, I'd love to invite Justin Archer and Megan Morris to join me on the virtual stage. Hi to you both. Um, as Jenny mentioned at the top, Justin is the lead for global quantitative research at Women's World Banking, 
Megan is policy manager at JPAL, focused on gender and finance, and both were invaluable contributors to the core group that we assembled in doing all of this work uh, that led to what Jenny just presented a moment ago. Um, so Justin, I'd love to start with you and then turn to Megan afterwards to get your impressions of the process, you know, what you found to be valuable, uh, what you found mm -hmm. to maybe be missing, and, and we still mm -hmm. need to sort of do in, in the next phase of the collab, as Jenny mentioned. Um, and then Megan, we'll, we'll turn to you. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, happy to be here. Um, so yeah, I, I was very impressed by the process. It made a lot of sense um, from the perspective of the uh, participants. Uh, who were part of the collaboration. We had a really nice mix of um, people representing organizations that had more of a research focus or ones that were more on the practitioner side that still did research. So we kind of had a, this nice mix of, um, you know, the underlying theory and people who were thinking about the theory and then people who were kind of approaching it from like the practical standpoint of like, well, how do we, like, what could we actually see change on the ground? Like, what have we seen change on the ground? And um, you know, what would be interesting to consider. Um, and then, you know, similarly, like the process was really um, made a lot of sense in that, you know, we started high level, start with developing this theory of change, and then um, you know, I kind of iterate through to where everyone was happy with it, and then move on to um, identifying, well, how do we actually measure those concepts? Um, you know, that was, I guess, moving forward, the, the collab process is really what makes the most sense. So, um, you know, we've some of what has been brought to the table is, um, um, you know, been tested by organizations, but some of it may be more is a bit like, I think that like, this is how we should go about measuring this. Um, but like going in and, and, and testing that like, okay, these indicators, um, how efficient and, and, um, like when we actually collect data on it and analyze it, like how telling will it, will they be? Um, like, are they covering the concept well? Um, are they, um, you know, if we have an intervention, are they, are they changing in a measurable way? Um, so hopefully like, uh, I'm expecting that there'll be some minor changes to what we have here um, out of that process, but I think generally what we have here will, will persist, so. That's great. Thank you, Justin. And I think we are all very much aligned in saying this is an intermediate rather than a final outcome. You know, what, what Jenny's presented and what you all can dig into deeper through the policy note that was just posted uh, recently, and we're looking forward to feedback and reactions, is very much a first cut of our attempt, Justin, as you were saying, to bring together a lot of different actors from a lot of different vantage points but who do care about financial inclusion and its implications for economic uh, justice, empowerment, advancement outcomes, however you decide to phrase it. Megan, I'll turn to you for your reactions on the process, um, what, what we could have done better, what went well, and then we'll bring Solange back in as well. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm here on behalf of j which for those who don't know is a uh, research network and we specialize in impact evaluation. So a bit with a different like wearing a different hat uh, as opposed to an implementing organization. But um, I think very broadly, like the, the, the motivation behind this project is very useful, both for the implementing partners that we work with, as well as the researchers within our network. There's like a real value in identifying some shared indicators across, con that can be, you know, useful across contexts. Um, as we produce more and more impact evaluations, it's like very useful then to be able to do meta-analysis or, or systematic reviews and have shared indicators that we can then compare across different programs and 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 contexts. At the same time, I think there'll always be this um, like uh, thing, you know, needle that we'll need to thread in terms of figuring out how to contextualize these indicators into specific into specific areas and, and, and with the specific interventions that implementing partners are, are um, implementing in the field. I think as probably all of us know in this room, something like women's economic empowerment is, is a complex, it's a process. It's not <laughs> how much income did you earn? What's the weight of the baby? Is there stunting? Like it's, it's as much 
uh, more context specific things like agency, especially can look very different in one context to, to another. So I think this will be something that we'll just like need to keep working on, uh, uh, just as empowerment is a process. I imagine this will continue to be a, a process, a cyclical process. So I think the collab will be a great step in that direction. Um, but but broadly, I agree with with Justin that like starting with the theory of change and then mapping on to, um, our outcomes and indicators was a really nice way, and that's uh, how we also um, suggest kind of figuring out how to measure women's economic empowerment at JPAL. We have um, a a toolkit that was um, written a few years back by Rachel Glenister, Lucia Diaz Martin, and and Claire Walsh that. Um, is is quite similar, and I think it really complements the work that's been done here. Um, so I think both both of those tools together will be this hopefully will be very helpful to partners who are are thinking about measuring um, women's empowerment and financial inclusion. That's great. Appreciate the feedback, Megan, on sort of the logical sequencing we all decided to proceed through. You know, starting with that theory of change in order to understand what we are talking about before being able to move into a discussion of exactly how to capture results of, of programs, interventions, investments. Um, and I wanna pick up on one of the other points you made around uh, adaptation to specific contexts and, and the need for that sort of flexibility as we're thinking sort of globally across these different contexts, ultimately it's gonna be necessary to zero in to make sure that the core group's recommendations are, are understood and meaningful for specific organizations and communities. Um, Solange, maybe with that in mind, we'll turn to you. I know you had mentioned in your presentation that this is the sort of output that CARE could anticipate picking up and using to inform its future efforts. And then let's move to Justin and Megan about how you'd anticipate at Women's World Banking and at JPAL using what we've done together going forward. So Solange. Yeah, I think we're really excited to have a, a theory of change that, that can be applied across organizations and across different types of interventions. And can I would see this as bringing together the work that's happening in the sector, right? Being able to compare, being able to all be on one page and see what's, what's happening. And so we do hope to play a role in this, um, in the measurement group and in the, in the collab. Um, and and I think what's what's a, a nice thing to see about this is you know each organization has their framework like we do as as well, and we um, but but it's really easy to see how that maps onto this TOC and I think that that gives a space for reflection of what are we measuring how does it match up how are we comparing and how can we we benchmark what's happening with other organizations and then see are, are are there areas where we could start doing more um and and kind of bring those interventions even though they're different a bit closer and be able to see um where we all are and how we can support each other in this so yeah we're really looking forward to uh to what's ahead with this with the next phase of uh testing that's great and obviously it is hugely reliant on the participation and the willingness to sort of expend some of your time and energy on on these forms of collaboration. So we're grateful. Uh, Justin and then Megan, looking ahead, what do you think we can do with what we've created together? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's going to be a very valuable tool for comparison, um, as, as Megan said. Um, you know, having common indicators, um, you know, internal to Women's World Banking, like we have a theory of change, and um, but we will look to incorporate some of the components um, from the one that we've developed here to see uh, how we may want to either um, change what we have, the way we ask questions to be more generalizable um, to what like all different types of programs are doing or other organizations are doing. Um, but it's also, you know, it's useful in getting us to think about, um, you know, the different um, types of projects that we have going on, like what makes, like we can use this framework um, that's quite broad to then like figure out what among it we want to bring in um, in any particular project. So Women's World Banking, you know, we have um, solutions that we develop uh, that we, you know, we, we work with financial service providers. Um, and some of these are, you know, have a focus on credit products. Some of them have a uh, focus on insurance products. 
Some of them are savings. Um, some of them are more about getting people onto digital platforms. Um, and uh, depending on which context we're doing, like the certain indicators make sense to include, other ones don't. Um, so it's nice to have this big framework that we can then pull from. Um, and then when we are looking at what another organization is doing, um, we can, we, you know, if they're using the same framework, uh, we'll have the same set of questions and then we can really compare like, okay, well, so Women's World Banking's design solution um, in this context had this, you know, we found these impacts um, when this other organization in a similar setting had a similar solution that they were testing, you know, maybe their solution um, was slightly less effective, slightly more effective, um, or, you know, had um, had stronger impacts in like certain areas of women's economic empowerment, whereas Women's World Banking solution impacted other areas uh, strong, more strongly. Um, I think that this, this initiative is what like enables that sort of like cross organization comparison as also like within an organization cross product type comparison. Um, you know, similarly saying like, well, you know, our, our credit products um, really help with, you know, if, um, improving this aspect of women's um, economic lives um, compared to, you know, a saving solution doing something different. That's great. Thank you, Justin. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head in reminding us all we're not just doing measurement for measurement's sake, but ultimately adopting comparable indicators is meant to drive that cross organization learning, right? To understand, hey, this, this worked better for this population. We use the same indicators. You know, we took the same measurement approach and maybe we can figure out what the issue was in design or in implementation to be able to tweak and, and improve over time. Uh, Justin, uh, not Justin, Justin, you're covered for the moment. Megan, I'll turn over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think this, I can imagine this being used in a, in a, in a few different ways. One, just, you know, sharing with our research network, uh, J-PAL is decentralized in the sense that the, the affiliated researchers kind of put, push forward with the implementing partners, their own evaluation. So it's not that we would say, now you need to use these indicators, but it's another tool in their toolkit for, for sure that I, I think will be very useful as we've already talked about for the reasons of being able to compare across uh, impact evaluations. Um, and, and see kind of like what are the threads that we're learning through the, our portfolio of, of, of impact evaluations. Exactly like you said, Megan, we don't just do an impact evaluation to say, yes, this worked. No, this didn't work. But why did it work? Why did it not work? Where are the breakdowns? So having the theory of change and the different indicators along our theory of change is super valuable for seeing the mechanisms that um, are working through these programs. And then um, being able to compare across um, uh, impact evaluations, so we'll just I think will be will be really great. And then I I can also imagine using this another you know big part of the work that we do at JPAL besides you know generating evidence is disseminating evidence and getting it into action. So using this as a tool to talk through with partners. Um, here's the kind of the evidence base that we have out there. Here's this, you know, broad theory of change that we're thinking about and, and, and mapping on kind of the existing evidence what, and using this theory of change in the, in the set of indicators as a tool to help talk through like what is the evidence base telling us about and, and thinking about um, how the evidence can then be put into action and, and, and used in um, decision making, I think this will this will also be helpful. That's great. And and where we do anticipate, you know, effects or outcomes to results, but there hasn't been research to validate or or call that into question, you know, that's that's a research gap to prioritize filling, right? That that we're maybe missing some of the benefits of these interventions if we're not thinking systematically across that sort of theory of change. I wanna to start to turn to the questions in the chat because we have a great group on the line and very uh, appreciative of folks who are tuning in to listen to this conversation. There was one question around inclusion in the process of selecting these sorts of indicators and, and how women being impacted by financial inclusion investments and interventions could be uh, included in, in conversations like this one and through the collab process. You all were very generous in sort of more emphasizing the benefits rather than the drawbacks of, of the core group we were able to assemble. But I do think um, one of our limitations is where we sit 
um, who we represent, who we are in our own kind of positionality. And so making sure to be sort of honest and humble about who was a part of this process and who was missing and how we ensure sort of reaching out to the populations who will ultimately be impacted by these efforts going forward. Um, Solange, I don't know if you want to start us off again with thoughts on that, and then we'll, we'll circle around. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And a really great question. Um, and, and I think at CARE, it, it, um, uh, for our indicators, it, it does depend on the, the program and, and how, um, how it's set up, how the design phase is, is set up. But I think one thing that's important to do to be able to reflect and have that, that learning that Megan is talking about is, um, you know, having, collecting data that allows us to understand are they satisfied with the programming, what's working and what's not working, and being able to then adjust and, and be agile um, and, and shift when we find that, that something isn't working for, um, for our project uh, participants. So I think we can get better at making sure that, you know, what we're measuring also matches up with what um, uh, what our what our project participants are interested in and what resonates with them and being able to to see um you know what this is all about so there's there's definitely um space to grow there thanks Solange. and I, i'd very much encourage all others listening in to share with us your your networks your suggestions for folks who maybe weren't a part of this initial core group but could be a part of the collab process to facilitate those linkages Justin, how does Women's World Banking think about inclusion of the target populations, the recipients of these services? How could we take lessons from your approach going forward? Yeah, um, I think like Women's World Banking has, like our current model is one of regional focus. We um, have strong presence in Nigeria, Indonesia, and India are like our three really key countries. And um, when we're looking to launch a new solution, um, we have in-country teams like from these countries that make up our, you know, our um, like everyone who's involved in like the research and advising of the bank or the whatever partner uh, we're engaging with. Um, so we're we're having like that that local lens there, but in addition. Um, uh, I think one of the strengths of, of the organization is that uh, part of our process is um, a full like institutional diagnostic process at the at the onset of a project, which includes customer research. So um, uh, our you know our in-country research team, along with our in-country advisory team, like they will go and speak to women on the ground and figure out what they like what they need. Um, the barriers that they uh, are facing and then trying to identify like what are the idiosyncrasies in this particular context like what barriers are like women here specifically facing especially if it's you know in the context of like you know, if it's a credit product or like a digital product um so it's a process like that could be um valuable to incorporate into like the next step of a collab which is like um you know getting that participatory learning and like I don't, uh, you know, not necessarily that we have to, you know, we shouldn't like send our US based re researchers into the field, um, but we could be a bit more intentional. Um, and like, at least from Women's World Banking's perspective, like taking our, what we're intending to input and like running it past um, our um, in country team a bit more um, to get their perspectives on it, like kind of using them as a, like a pathway of getting like, the voices of women that they've gone and spoken to already um so they've kind of voiced like what they're um like you know how they're conceiving of you know what they want measured in some sense um yeah like to get into the process that's great thank you and megan i know you know jpel also has researchers all over the world across countries as justin was saying like like women's world banking has in-country teams how do you all think about connecting with target populations. I know it's tricky, right, in order to maintain kind of the validity and the rigor of a study at times. Um, but thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's it's very important in all contexts, but especially in when we're thinking about women's empowerment and economic empowerment, like 
you know, doing the formative research uh, before deciding what your theory of change is or your indicators are going to be to understand what does agency look like in this context? What would empowerment look like? What, where are the women and girls at, you know, at the, at the starting point and what are they looking for in their own lives? Um, to then understand what do we need to be measuring? If we're, if we're not, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, like it's very useful to have standardized uh, metrics and indicators to compare across, but at the same time, we have to also have context specific indicators, especially in something like an impact evaluation. Um, so doing that formative research at the beginning and then piloting, 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 and then piloting again, those indicators to make sure that they're working in your context. And then I think, you know, something that all of academia and, and JPAL can do better and we are working on um, over the last few years is, is making sure that we have more locally based researchers within our research network. And we know that that's important to have better evaluation, have better knowledge creation is including researchers that are based in the country and and uh, from the country that, or even, you know, more specifically the, the area that uh, the intervention is being implemented. So that's something that we'll just continue to, to work on over the next few years, but I think is, is super important. Thanks, Megan. We probably have time for just one more round. Uh, and we have a great question in the chat about one particular area of, of the indicators that we put together as a core group, and that's around financial health and resilience. Um, I will say that in organizing our sessions over the past year plus, you know, this was a topic that came up a lot. It was top of mind for us as valuable, even where measurement efforts are not quite as far along, you know, in, in contrast to some of the other areas of economic empowerment that we discussed. Um, Solange, Justin, Megan, how are your organizations thinking about capturing financial health and resilience? Uh, and I'll also use this as your opportunity to sort of sum up and, and share any last reflections with our audience before we close. Solange, I know I keep putting you on the spot, but are you okay to start again? Sure, I can. I can start again. Um, I, I don't think we have a, um, a, a a clear, as you said. I mean, this is a, the newer concept, and we're we're still catching up with um, financial health and resilience. I think financial resilience um, we look at with a, a um, kind of a handful of of indicators because there isn't just one um, that captures that. So we look at uh, sa the amount of savings that someone's have has, as well as their ability to. Um, to to get money in a in a pinch and um, be able to take out a loan even but I think that indicator also needs to be weighted and and you know is that um, is that financial resilience and financial health or could the person become over indebted right so that's why you need a range of these to be able to um, to understand this so I think this is a um, an incredible concept that is becoming uh, mainstreamed um, and really important and I think we need we need to all as a sector get our get our head around around that and and what does that mean and how do we you know exactly like what are we what are we measuring and are we measuring exactly what we want uh, with with these um, with with this. And um, yeah, this has been a, a really great um, panel. I've, I've uh, um, well, well done, and happy to be a part of this, and um, and uh, looking forward to um, to these to these next steps, and and being able to to each of these organizations <laughs> take a step closer together, and and look a little more closely um, at what we're doing. Um, inside and uh, it'll be an interesting and exciting journey I think to be able to do that but it'll push us that much further forward so thank you thank you for being a part of it and I appreciate the point you made around using what we already have at our disposal as we think about these new broader concepts like financial health and resilience you know if savings is one component of that we've got a lot more experience measuring savings um, through global findex and, and other platforms I'm going to turn to to Justin and then Megan to round us out yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think Solange, is, when you mentioned, um, you know, it's a bit difficult to measure right now. It's it's um, that kind of resonates here. Like we, when we're when we're looking to measure financial health and financial resilience, I think that we take an approach that's like um, perce perceptions of the of those concepts, and then trying to measure directly. 
um, you know, we use the FinDEX questions about, you know, uh, if you had to come up with a 120th of GNI per capita, yada, yada, um, as a, you know, as one kind of indicator towards um, financial resilience. Um, but we also, like, what we're, what we're trying to include in our surveys uh, is, like, well, what are your, what's your perception of your financial health? Um, you know, trying to get at, like, you know, that, that perception, like, if there were a shock, like, how would you be able to, um, to, um, like, weather that storm, or, like, do you have savings built up to, to cover that? Uh, but then there's the other approach that's, like, okay, well, did you experience a shock? Um, you know, we, we're looking to use, um, you know, if you try to, find some bright spot of uh, COVID, like using like, you know, we can, we, on one of our surveys, we included a, mo a module on like, you know, how badly were your, were your household finances impacted by COVID? Um, and like with that kind of data set, like with that combined with some other indicators, um, especially ones of like material related changes, like your actual savings um, or measurements of formal and informal savings, um, we can see, you know, uh, did a, you know, did an intervention like actually help those households who experienced a more significant shock, um, like weather in a in, in a, a better manner than those who didn't have that that product. Um, you know, instances instances of shocks are like, you know, they're they're less common. So when we're um, running power calculations, and figuring out sample sizes, um, you know. It's a bit, you know, it's hard to measure reliably and like with sufficient power, um, but it is still something that like, you know, we are looking at and hoping to see that, you know, what we're doing helps people um, with uh, resilience and in, in, in like when actual events happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and again, I'll just echo Solange, it's a great, it was, uh, the panel has been great, the collaboration has been great, um, really looking forward to um, like the outcomes of the collab and, um, you know, those seeing how the the work that we've done so far gets like translated into that kind of like final step of like, okay, this is, these are questions that everyone should be using uh, when you can um, to help measure these, these uh, components of women's economic empowerment. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. yeah, more more good work to do together. Uh, and on the financial health piece, you know, appreciate you framing it both as those more objective measures that maybe are lower hanging fruit, but then also some of the subjective ones around individuals' perceptions and their own perceived resilience to shock. That's going to be a critical component of, of that more holistic concept. So thank you for that. Megan, bring us home. Great. I don't, yeah, I think um, just to echo what Justin and Solange have said, resilience is very important <laughs> and, and increasingly important with the pandemic, with climate change. We know more and more shocks are coming. Um, and we also know that, you know, shocks had, can be really damaging to women's businesses, to their financial health. So we need to keep figuring out how to measure this. I think it's a re resilience is, is somewhat can be like a fuzzy term. And so just finding more precise ways to, to measure that will be very helpful. And I, I think the collab and future iterations of this work will hopefully get us there. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. So for all of you joining, we know that this has been brief and, and sought to cover a lot of ground in a short time, but hopefully this gives you a flavor of the motivations for why we did this work the systematic and collaborative approach we sought to use in order to get done what we've gotten done so far, and even a little bit of the nitty gritty in the weeds, you know, debate and discussion around a particular concept, a particular indicator, what are the definitions, what are the uh, sorts of variables we need to grapple with in order to do measurement well in this space. Um, very grateful to our collaborators and co-organizers at FinEquity, Data2x, and of course my wonderful team at the Center for Global Development. Want to thank Megan, Justin, and Solange for representing their organizations as core group participants, but also to the rest of the core group that really, as Justin flagged, you know, spanned the full spectrum of folks sitting at NGOs, at fintechs, at international financial institutions, at financial service providers. Uh, so we're grateful to you all for, for being on this journey with us. And please do stay tuned uh, for, for next steps. And if you are interested in participating in the collab process, uh, reach out to, to myself, to Jenny, 
uh, or, or others at FinEquity, CGD, and Data2x to be involved. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.